Well, two weeks ago, we spent our time, for the most part, uh, in the first paragraph of chapter 4 of the Confessions. You can turn in your copies there. Chapter 4 of the Confession. Now, since it's been a while, we'll go ahead and read the whole chapter. It's been a couple weeks. And then we'll recap a bit what we've learned so far, since the truths in the Confession are building upon one another. Chapter 4 of the Confession, Creation. In the beginning, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was pleased to create or make the world and all things in it, both visible and invisible, in a six-day period and all very good. He did this to manifest the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. After God had made all the other creatures, he created humanity. He made them male and female, with rational and immortal souls, thereby making them suited to that life lived unto God for which they were created. They were made in the image of God, being endowed with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. They had the law of God written in their hearts and the power to fulfill it. Even so, they could still transgress the law because they were left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject to change. In addition to the law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As long as they obeyed this command, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are the Lord of hosts, you are the King of glory. We worship you and praise you now as we're gathered together yet again on the Lord's day. And I pray that that, that would be something that every soul here is, is just welling up with thanksgiving for. What a privilege we have to gather with the saints on the Lord's day. What a privilege we have to even know what the Lord's day is, to have been called unto Christ for salvation, and now to live a life uh, pleasing in his sight. What a privilege. Let us not uh, see ourselves as poor, but rich. If the whole world were to uh, turn away their gaze from these truths, if it were just us, we would be the, the richest of the whole world. We have truth. And there is nothing more valuable than truth. There's no greater currency. Tomorrow, many will line up at certain places for physical food that will be handed out. And it's amazing, as we've seen, the lines of cars that are often there for bread and water that you call out from your word. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Thank you, Father, for gathering us together this evening to the banquet of your word. I pray that we would treasure it. Those who cannot be here, we ask that you bless them and supplement uh, their joy, uh, the lackings that they have for not being able to gather together with the saints. Those who ought to be here, I pray that you convict them. That's a, that's a request made from love for their, for their good, that they would see just the utter foolishness of seeking bread and, and water temporal things that will perish when they have at no cost to themselves not that it was free for Christ paid the ultimate price but at no cost to themselves they have bread that will lead, lead them to be never hungry again and water that will lead them to never be thirsty again forgive them we ask and lead them to repentance and we pray that you would now uh, prepare our minds, prepare our hearts I pray that, that the worship that we've already conducted the prayer 
will have prepared us to receive your word as it's outlined in the confession. Thank you for it. And may it affect our lives unto holiness and righteousness that we would grow uh, pleasing in your sight. Thank you that in Christ we are already accepted. His work is finished and complete. Thank you that we can rest in that. Now, let us live in accordance with these truths, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I said, a quick recap on what we've learned so far since it's been a couple weeks. We learned in <clears throat> chapter 1 that general revelation, that which we see in creation, clearly demonstrates the goodness, wisdom, and power of God so that man is without excuse. Every person knows there is a God, but men suppress that knowledge for their own desires. We learned that general revelation is insufficient, however, to give the knowledge of God and his will that is necessary for salvation. Therefore, God, for his glory, revealed these things through men who wrote them down in what we call Scripture. The Holy Scriptures are, therefore, necessary and the only sufficient, certain, and infallible standard of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. We learned which books are rightly called canonical, and which books are not. We learned that the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture, a principle called the Analogia Scripturae, or the Analogy of Scripture. And we learned that, this, that Scripture is the supreme judge for deciding all religious controversies and for evaluating all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, human teachings, and individual interpretations. Not personal opinions, not personal experience, whether or not we've seen something practiced in the church before, but scripture alone. In this judgment we are to rest, and in the scriptures our faith finds its final word. In chapter 2, we learned about the nature and character of God. We learned that he is one, the only living and true God, that his essence cannot be understood by anyone but him. We could have spent months going over all the attributes of God found in this chapter, and perhaps we'll return to that one day. But we focused on specifically his aseity, his aseity, that he is entirely self-sufficient. He needs no one and no thing. He created not out of a sense of need, but in order to glorify himself as an outpouring of his glory and love. And we learned that God is one divine and infinite being who consists of three real persons, the Father, the Word or the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One undivided essence in three co-equal, distinct subsistences or hypostases. In chapter 3, we learned that God from all eternity decreed everything that occurs without reference to anything outside of himself. Without being the author of sin or in fellowship with any in their sin, without violating the will of the creature or taking away the free work or contingency of second causes, in order to display his wisdom in directing all things and his power in accomplishing all he decrees, and for the demonstration of his glory, he predestined some humans and angels to eternal life through Jesus Christ, to the praise of his glorious grace, while leaving others in their sins, leading to their just condemnation, to the praise of his glorious justice. The one living and true God is really sovereign. He is really sovereign, not partially sovereign, as is the uh, contemporary evangelical Arminian kind of semi-Pelagian sense. Not partially sovereign, but really sovereign. Reformed doctrine is a cohesive whole. And when we say God is sovereign, we really mean he is sovereign. He's not just sovereign over most of creation and then salvation is where his sovereignty ends. No. He is really and truly sovereign over all things. Salvation included. Amen. And so far we've learned in chapter 4 that the one living and triune God, in perfect harmony of intent, scope, and means, created all things. 
Just as salvation is the product of the harmony in the Godhead, as the Father chooses and adopts, the Son atones for and justifies, and the Holy Spirit regenerates and sanctifies a people who are individually and unchangeably designated, whose number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or decreased, all for the glory of God alone. So, in the same way, creation was the product of triune harmony. And we learned or bolstered our confidence in the truth that God made all things in six literal days and he rested on the seventh. There is only one living and true God, and he is the one who made all things in six literal days, and he rested on the seventh. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And in the Old Testament, part of worshiping God in truth meant what that meant was working for six days as he did, and resting as he did on the seventh, on the Sabbath. This was a sign and a covenant between the people of the living and true God and God himself. I wanted to bring this up last week. Um, but time didn't allow it. One of the statements affirmed in our Constitution is the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Uh, if you haven't looked that up yet, that would be a great resource for you to study, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Article 12 of that statement says this, We affirm that Scripture, in its entirety, is inerrant, being free from all falsehood, fraud, or deceit. We deny that biblical infallibility and inerrancy are limited to spiritual, religious, or redemptive themes, exclusive of assertions in the fields of history and science. We further deny that scientific hypotheses or theories about Earth history may properly be used to overturn the teaching of Scripture on creation and the flood. Scripture informs and guides scientific, scientific inquiry, not the other way around. The worldview of the observer and the scientific method will always determine the understanding of the data. God really did create the world and everything in it in six literal days. And we learned that God is neither contained nor constrained by the natural laws that he himself made. Human history is punctuated by divine actions that transcend the physical. Indeed, creation itself is one such event, as well as the incarnation, the resurrection, and the second coming of Christ. Those who say otherwise are scoffers, according to Scripture. Our hope is in the very reality that God does really, physically, and spiritually work all things from a droplet of rain to an individual's salvation to the whole redemptive story according to his wise perfect, and good counsel. And this week, we're going to explore what the inspired, sufficient, inerrant, infallible, necessary word of God has authoritatively declared about the triune God who eternally decreed and carried out his plan to create man on the sixth, literal, 24-hour day of creation. And we're going to consider what the Bible has to say about the nature of that man and all mankind with him. John Calvin said that, uh, that wisdom lies in knowing God and knowing oneself. Wisdom lies in knowing God and knowing oneself. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of, and hence the knowledge of God, says Proverbs 1.7. If we do not know God, we cannot really know ourselves, so it is right that the confession addressed first, God and the Holy Trinity. In light of that knowledge, wisdom demands we next lay hold of and submit to what the Word of God has to say about man, about us. So to the word and to the testimony, to the inspired mirror we fly. We'll spend most of our time uh, between this week and maybe next week, we'll see, exploring what it means to be made in the image of God. What it means to be made in the image of God, undeniably the most profound revelation of the nature of man. But first, we'll address several other uh, important anthropological distinctions or, or uh, characteristics of man that make man who and what he is, as we just read in the confession. First, or number one, man is not an animal. Man is not an animal, but a distinct and unique creature. He is distinct from the rest of creation. He is distinct from animals. And maybe you're thinking that these things are self-evident or obvious. They're not in our culture today. 
They haven't been for some time, and our children are going to grow up and have to give answers for these things. And maybe some of us have unknowingly yielded to some of these philosophies. The confession clearly demonstrates from the Word of God that man is not an animal. He is a distinct and unique creature. Paragraph 2 of chapter 4 begins with, After God made all the other creatures, he created humanity. After God made all the other creatures, he created humanity. Please turn to Genesis chapter 1 in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 24 through 31 in Genesis chapter 1 record God's creative activity on the sixth day of creation. Follow along as I read. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant, every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. After God made all the other creatures, he created humanity. After. Man is distinct from the rest of creation. The creation of man was its own event. The Bible does not say, and, and as God was making the animals, he, he made one which he called man. No. The same language that is employed throughout the creation account to segment it, to segment it, to, to differentiate between different aspects of the creative act, separates animals from mankind here. And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. God said, let there be light. There was light, and God saw that it was good. God separated the dry land from the waters, and God saw that it was good. God uh, it created vegetation, and God saw that it was good. God made the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he saw that it was good. God made livestock, creeping things, and beasts, and he saw that it was good. God made man. There's a clear demarcation between the creation of the animals and the creation of man. God made animals, it was good, then God made man. Man is not an animal. Mankind is distinct from animals. Whatever the similarities, human beings are not part of the animal kingdom. Humans are distinct. They're not even mammals, regardless of the similitudes. They're not even mammals, regardless of the facts that we are, for example, ambulatory, we're able to move on our own, that we're chordates or we have a backbone, that we have hair, milk glands, or grasping fingers, none of these make us mammals, for mammal is an ontological or categorical distinction within the animal kingdom. Mammals are a class of a phylum of the animal kingdom. Man is not an animal. Man is not a mammal. And similarities should not be surprising to us anyway. Of course there are similarities. There is one creator. Of course there are similarities. There is one creator. But that does not mean that we're the same as animals. We share similarities with plants, too. But that doesn't make us conifers. Biblically, even when we see resemblances, uh, biblically even, we do see resemblances between animals and man. We even see it in Scripture. We see these 
resemblances. The scripture doesn't try to avoid that. It doesn't try to hide it. But again, we would expect similarities, since there is one designer. A couple of the similarities we see in the Bible are that God made both man and animals from the ground. He made them both from the ground. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and chapter 2, verse 19. And he animated both with his breath of life. Genesis chapter 1, verse 30, and chapter 2, verse 7. But similarities do not mean sameness. Man is no more an animal than he is God by virtue of the communicable attributes. He's no more an animal than he is God by virtue of the communicable attributes. After God made all the other creatures, he created humanity. Man is, is the apex, the, the high watermark of creation, totally distinct from all other creatures. Second, he made them male and female. He made them male and female. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We read in Genesis chapter 2 that God made the, the man first. He made the first man, Adam, from the dust of the ground. He then made Eve, the first woman, from the man. Genesis chapter 2, you can just probably flip the page right over to verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He made them male and female. We will not linger long here. The degree of darkness into which our society has fallen is manifest in its willingness to deny the most basic and self-evident realities about the nature of humanity. There's no fear of God before their eyes, and they deny the clear revelation of their maker. But let it be said without obfuscation and without apology from this pulpit, he made them male and female. There is no such thing as gender fluidity, and there are not many genders. There are two. Male and female, he created them. Another sermon series could be spent on the beauty of this distinction. A beauty that is destroyed in the current foolish theories of this culture. It is a beautiful distinction. But for now, let it suffice. He made them male and female. Let's take uh, one more thing into consideration briefly before moving on. Male and female, he created them, the inspired text says. And we understand from the same revelation that there was at the outset one male, one man named Adam, and one female, one woman named Eve. God created two individuals, a male and a female. He didn't make several or many, but two. Two individuals, and from these two, the whole earth was populated. From these two individuals, Adam and Eve, the whole earth was populated. Every single human being's genealogy will eventually reach back to the first couple. So what's the point? What's the point I'm trying to get at here? The point is that there is only one human race. There is only one human race. There are not many races, or even several. There is one. Black, white, yellow, red, these are not races. They are subjective and arbitrary terms that really mean nothing. There is only one human race. There is only one human race. And oh, that our culture would submit itself to the Word of God. And may it yet be so. So man is distinct from all other creatures. God made mankind male and female. And there is only one human race race. In the confession, these embattled truths are held high for all to see. No wonder so many have argued for the utilization of Reformed confessions and catechisms through, through the years. No wonder many have argued for this. If more had, perhaps we would not as a culture be fighting battles that were won long ago. If children grew up with these emblems of divine revelation before their eyes, perhaps fewer would be inclined to fix their gaze upon lower and sillier things. Every generation is made up of individuals. Every generation is made up of 
individuals who need to be born again and need to be taught the wisdom of God. And that generation that allows itself to become lax in its instruction of the next, even if it be the most holy generation to ever walk the earth, will undoubtedly, but for the sovereign grace of God, be allowed by a most be followed by a most pernicious and foolish one. Even the most holiest generation, if it will not instruct the rest, will be followed by a most pernicious and foolish one. Man is distinct from all other creatures. God made mankind male and female, and from that first man and woman came the human race. Thirdly, thirdly, God made man with rational and immortal souls. God made man with rational and immortal souls. Man is bipartite. Man is bipartite, having two parts. He has two parts, according to the Bible. He's not just a body, and he's not just a soul. And he's not body, soul, and spirit, which would be the tripartite view. He is body and soul, bipartite. In the face of materialism, the belief that there is nothing spiritual, Materialism is the belief that there's nothing spiritual, everything is matter. In the face of that, in the face of that monopartite, you could say, or, or one part view of man, his only body, the Word of God, which is mapped out for us in the confession, states that God made man with a body and a soul. Man has a body and a soul. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we've already alluded to. God made man from the dust of the ground. Man has a physical body. Part of his constitution is physical. He was made from the physical earth. He is actually physical. Genesis 3 verse 19 repeats this assertion in the context of the curse that man would die and return to the ground from which he was made. You are dust and to dust you shall return. And Psalm 90 verse 3 echoes it as well. You return man to dust and say return O children of man. Literally, return, O children of Adam. Man is physical. He has a physical body. He was made from the physical earth. But man is also spiritual. He's also spiritual. He has a soul. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, depicts clearly the bipartite nature of man. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Single Christian women, according to the Apostle Paul, are undivided in their efforts and devotions because they are able to be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, a very interesting uh, passage, Paul tells, Paul tells about a man in Christ, quote-unquote, a man in Christ, indirectly referring to himself, who was caught up to the third heaven, and he goes on to say, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. So setting aside the, the whole matter of, of the third heaven for now, the point is that there are two options in Paul's mind. There are two options for Paul. To be in the body, for the soul or the spirit to be in the body, or to be out of the body, for the soul or the spirit to be out of and separated from the body. There, there are two options in Paul's mind. And lastly, James chapter 2, verse 26 says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. James uses an illustration, as an illustration, uh, for the necessary consequence of true faith. He uses as an illustration for what true faith will look like, the bipartite nature of man. So we see that the Bible is full of clear statements about the bipartite nature of man. Man is, man is body and soul, not just soul. The body is not a mirage. It is real. And he's not just body. There is a, he has a soul. And the rejection of this, another basic truth, has led to some of the most abominable theories ever devised by the human mind. It has left untold numbers of spiritually and physically tortured human creatures in its wake. The most obvious manifestation of this rejection of God's revelation about the nature of man is found in modern psychology. Modern psychology. Modern psychology is predicated on the foolish premise that there is no God. 
Modern psychology is based on, is founded on, the foolish idea that there is no God. Most of the so-called fathers of modern psychology were militantly anti-theist, against the belief in God, not just atheists. And since they had suppressed the knowledge of God and their unrighteousness, they also rejected what the Bible teaches about the nature of man, that man is body and soul. But if there is no God, nothing is spiritual. Everything is physical. So man is just matter in motion. He's just material. Everything he does, thinks, and feels is the result of, of some combination of biological processes, not the function of a soul. Man is monopartite, of, of one part, just the body in that view. He's just body. And out of this combination of an evolutionary conception of human origins that we evolved, with the materialistic view that we're just matter, modern psychology has come up with its own answers for things like human suffering, depression, anxiety, mania, post-traumatic stress, and so on. Since there is no soul, the problem cannot be spiritual. It must be physical in their view. And from this has sprung the entirely unscientific theories of chemical imbalances in the brain and mental illnesses. And as a result, countless Thousands of beautiful, bipartite image-bearers are having their humanity suppressed by so-called antidepressants, antipsychotics, and anti-anxiety medications, most if not all of them being neurotoxins or brain poison, all under the guise that the problems that human beings face are only material in nature. Now, just briefly, all of this is not to say that there are not organic or biological conditions that could predispose an individual to certain conditions of mental distress. I'm not saying that. And it is not to say that, brain, uh, that the brain cannot be damaged, leading to, leading to undesirable behavior. We're not saying that. And, but a biblical bipartite view of man actually takes this into consideration. The biblical view is actually able to take this into consideration as well. Ministering rightly to a human with a body and a soul will mean addressing issues with both since both make man what he is. But man's problem is not primarily physical. It is spiritual. The Bible is clear. Man sinned against God and stands in need of a Savior. The consequences of that sin are vast, certainly even extending to our bodies. But the problem with modern psychology is an example. Besides the fact that it rages against the Lord and His anointed one, is that its diagnoses are incorrect, since they reject the reality of the soul. And if the diagnosis is incorrect, then the prescription will be incorrect as well. So man is a distinct and unique creation, not an animal. He was made by God, male and female. The first couple being the root of the whole human race. And man is bipartite. Two parts, body and soul. And lastly, and finally, man is made in the image of God. Man is made in the image of God. They were made in the image of God, we read in the confession, with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And as I began uh, studying this pro really profound revelation about the nature of man, I think we just hear this, we just kind of know it, so we just move on, but it is the most profound revelation about the nature of man. I discovered that there's been uh, actually considerable debate uh, through the centuries over its meaning. There's been a lot of debate over what does it mean to be made in the imago Dei, the, the image of God? What makes us different from animals? Maybe we can understand what the Imago Dei is by looking at the differences between men and animals. Is that one way? All of these questions have received different answers throughout the centuries, which may at first be a little unsettling. This is the most basic and important aspect of our nature. Do we not have uh, an answer for what it means? Are we not even sure what it means? Irenaeus, seeing a difference between tselem, or image, and demuth or likeness, those are, the, those are the words in the original language, argued that at the fall, man lost his likeness to God, but
but not the image of God. Aquinas said that man's reason is the, Im is the image of God. His reason is the image of God. Calvin said the soul, or the mind and the heart. Augustine saw the mental capacities of the memory, understanding, and will as the distinctions that make us in the image of God. Another view has been called the, the functional view, and as it sounds, its focus is on what man does, what his functions are. Uh, so in particular, that he exercises dominion over the other creatures. Karl Barth saw in the Imago Dei a reflection of the relational nature of the Trinity. And so he argued that it is our social and relational capacity that best defines what it means to be made in the image of God. Martin Luther emphasized man's original righteousness as the key component of what Scripture means when it says that man was made in the image of God. The image, the image therefore, in, in Luther's uh, mind, though not lost, as we will see, was severely damaged in the fall and must be restored in and by Christ. That would be Luther's uh, perspective. I'm going to humbly go with some contemporary authors on this one, which I know is weird, because we kind of like to stick with the old dead guys around here. Um, but I think Sam Storms and, and uh, uh, Sam Waldron, and probably others, um, <clears throat> these are just two that I looked at, um, but I think they provide the best answers in this matter for the big picture and the application of what it means for man to be made in the image of God. They argue that the best answer for what the Imago Dei, being made in the image of God, means is all of the above. All of the above. In some sense, being made in the image of God would include all of the truths just mentioned. Reason, mental capacities, dominion, relationship, original righteousness, and a progression into the image of God in Christ. All of these touch on some aspect of what it means to be made in the image of God. And this makes sense when we consider the phrase itself. When we consider the phrase, the image of God. Let's just focus for a moment on the word God. Let's just, just set aside image for a second. Let's just focus on the word God. Whatever it means to be the image, whatever that means, we know that the image we are made in is God's. Right? We're made in God's image. God, we already know, thankfully, from our studies in the confession, is infinite, boundless, and beyond complete understanding. As we learned in chapter 2, his essence cannot be understood by anyone but him. So it really shouldn't surprise us that we would have some difficulty in putting our finger on precisely what it means to be made in the image of God, since he is the only one who, who completely uh, comprehends himself. And it should be easy to accept, then, that all of the theories above, the ones that we just mentioned, probably have some justification in the limitless meaning of the Imago Dei. All of these positions are true, as Storm says, in what they affirm, but they fall short when they limit the meaning by what they deny. I think that's the best position. Now let's take a look at the word image. Is, is this thing, this image, one thing? Or, or is it two things? You mentioned Irenaeus. Are likeness and image different? I said before that the original, in the original language, Selim uh, and Demuth are the words. Image is Selim and Demuth is likeness. Are these two aspects? Are they, these two sides of, of human nature, are we made in the image of God and in his likeness? Well, I think it can be clearly and pretty simply demonstrated that these two terms are just synonyms. They're just synonyms. And what we are seeing in Genesis 126 is just a Hebrew, a Hebrew literary tool that is meant to provide emphasis for a particular truth. In other words, this verse is simply emphasizing the wonder of the reality that man was made in the image of God. And it does so by using two words, two synonyms, to express it, to stress the reality. In verse 27 of Genesis chapter 1, only the word tselem is used. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Only the word tselem, T-S-E-L-E-M, is used. So God made man in his own image, tselem. In the tselem image of God, he created him. No mention of demuth or likeness here. No mention at all. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, on the other hand, we read... This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the demuth, in the likeness of God. No mention of Selim here. So if these two terms were any more than, than synonymous expressions of a single fact, if they represented two distinct aspects of the nature of, of man, 
we would expect to see them both. And any time that God mentions man being made in his image, we'd, we'd want to see both of these. We'd expect to see both if they represent two parts of man. But instead what we see is that they can be used interchangeably. So one, one reality is just being expressed by two terms. To put it simply, one reality is just being expressed by two terms. Man was made in the image and likeness of God, one and the same, one concept, two words. When we look at the words meaning in the original language, we see more reason to conclude that they're just synonyms. And what it means to be in the image or likeness of God begins to come into focus. Tselem, or image, means replica. Replica. Uh, likeness, or denouth, designates something that looks like something else, which sounds a lot like replica. In both cases, a complex idea of a visible replica comes across. So just as kings, this would be a good analogy, just as kings would put their images on coinage, on coins, they put their images on coins, or in the forms of statues, and they would do so in order to convey their power, their grandiosity, perhaps their magnanimity to their kingdoms. God has placed his image on earth to show forth his attributes. He has placed man on earth to image himself, his nature and character in creation. That's what's being expressed here. It is also important to note that this image is not merely something that man possesses. Man does not have the image of God. Okay? I know some of this sounds nuanced, but it is really important. Man does not just have the image of God. He is the image of God. It's not a quality or attribute that can be lost. It's, a, it's fundamental to what it means to be human. If we were to cease to be the image of God, we would cease to be human. It's not like being bipedal, which means that you walk on two legs. That's what bipedal means. It's not like that. Humans are bipedal, but, but that is not an essential attribute. If it were, if you lost your legs, you'd also cease to be human, right? But if the image of God were removed, man would no longer be man. He would cease to exist. The image of God is something that man is, not something man has. Man's purpose, the very reason he was created, the only reason he draws breath, is to glorify God by imaging him to the world. Everything a man, everything you and I, Think, do, how we reason, how we relate to others, how we relate to the world around us. Everything was intended to image the one living and true God. And this is really where the application begins to set in. Being made for the purpose of glorifying God, being made to image him, to reflect who and even what he is to the world around us, is something that involves every aspect of our lives. Because it involves every aspect of who we are by nature. There is nothing in our daily lives, nothing that is irrelevant to the fact that we were made to image God. Everything you do, everything you do is communicating something about God. Even the things you do in secret are imaging God. Because consider this, Adam was in the image of God uh, even before Eve was made, wasn't he? Wasn't Adam imaging God even before Eve was made and, and no one else was around, it was just him? Who, who was he imaging God to? Plants, animals, things visible and invisible, angels both fallen and upright, the very cosmos, and God himself. Even if there are no other observer, observers, you are imaging God. And he is the most important audience. Amen. Now this is a fearful thought. This is a fearful thought when we consider that our secret sins are laid bare before the one who sees all. But it is also a wonderful thought. Your God is the one who sees in secret. And he will reward you for imaging him rightly because he sees in secret. He is the center of the universe, not man. God is the center of the universe, not man. It doesn't matter if other men don't see something. If a tree falls in the woods, yes, there's a sound, even though nobody's around. Because man is not the center of the universe. God is. Everything was made for him, not for man. He is the primary audience of his own glory and image. He is the audience, not man. Even when no one else sees, God does. And he rewards right imaging of him, even when it is done in secret. 
And this remains our purpose even after the fall. Even after the fall, it's still our purpose to image him. Image him. Some have said, as we mentioned, that man lost this aspect of his nature altogether, that he lost imaging God altogether at the fall. But this is not true. Again, really rather easily demonstrated from Scripture. It's not true. Man did not cease to be the image of God after the fall. How do we know this? By Genesis 9, verse 6. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. We know that man did not stop being the image of God after the fall because of the biblical teaching of capital punishment. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. After the fall, when God is establishing one of the most important pillars of society, the sanctity of human life, he appeals to the fact that he made man in his own image. Why should a murderer be put to death? Because he is destroying the image of God. And the only thing that expresses how heinous such an act is, would be for the offender to lose his very life. So we see that even after the fall, man was in the image of God, and all that that means was and still is relevant. Now, here's the problem. Something relevant to the image of God did occur at the fall. Something did happen. Something did change. Whereas, before sin came into the world, the man was imaging God rightly. Adam was imaging God Rightly, Eve was imaging God rightly before the fall. God's knowledge and righteousness and holiness were being imaged rightly after the fall. Though man is still imaging God, he is imaging God wrongly. After the fall, man is imaging God wrongly. Men sin and reflect the image of God to the world around them. You sin, I sin, and reflect the image of God to the world around you. That image, the distorted image, you reflect that to the world around you. You lie, and by lying you communicate as the image of God that the one in whose image you have been made is a liar. You steal, and you communicate to the world around you that God is a thief. You are selfish, unfaithful, anxious, covetous, idolatrous. You gossip, slander, grumble, you're lazy, impatient, unloving, rude, and you keep records of wrongs. You delight in evil, you're unkind, you boast, you're proud, you're easily angered, and you communicate all of these things as an image bearer, as if they were true of God himself. What will God do with that thing that communicates such evil about who he is? What will he do to that image that so absolutely and heinously misrepresents him. He will surely destroy it, will he not? He will surely grind it to dust, burn it, crush it, consume it, for it misrepresents who he is. This reality is the grounds for his perfect justice and terrifying judgments. He hates all sin because it mis misrepresents him. And he will certainly not clear the guilty. He hates all sin because it misrepresents him. Yet the grounds for the terrible wrath and judgment of God are also a foundation for our hope. For God will not suffer his image to be distorted forever. He loves his image, and he will not see it distorted forever. He loves it, not in some narcissistic, self-centered way, but rightly. He loves his image rightly as he is the chiefest and greatest treasure. As he is consummate beauty and splendor and radiance and perfection. As the greatest commandment is to love him with all one's heart, soul, mind, and strength, so he loves himself. For to love anything more than himself would be idolatry. It is impossible for him to love something more than himself, and it would be a terrible evil if he did. Loving his image, he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. In this sense, he loves the whole world. An individual, salvific, elective love is reserved only for those whom he has foreknown. But his common love, or common grace, is for all who bear his image, because he loves his image. And it is for this reason that he will restore some who were made in his image, that they might once again image him rightly. The elect of God are those whom God has chosen to reform, to restore into a right image of him. 
through faith in the one who is the express image of God, the one who perfectly demonstrated in everything his thoughts, his reasons, his will, his relationships, his dominion, the image of God perfectly in all things because he was and is God, through faith in him you are being restored into a right image of God. Not based on your own imaging of God, your own righteousness. For before you were granted faith, you did nothing but misrepresent Him. Before you were granted faith, you did nothing but misrepresent Him. But based on the perfect imaging of Jesus Christ, on His perfect righteousness, you are now being restored into an accurate image bearer of God. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. In order that you would now image him rightly. And now you love his image. You love his image. Now that you've been regenerated, you love his image, where before you hated it. And if, he had, if, his, if his image had come to earth before you, you would have killed it. You love it now. You strive to be like him. You love his image, which you see in others, though it remains distorted. And so you love your neighbor. You love his image, so you love him, and you strive to be like him. And you love his image in others, so you, you strive to love your neighbor. This is the power of God at work in you. The non-elect, on the other hand, are those whom God has chosen to destroy as a demonstration of his rightful hatred of that which defaces his image. Quoting uh, Waldron, the, mor the moral duty of man is to be like God, to follow his example. As man is the image of God, his sin is always the misrepresentation of God. The sinner perversely represents God. Our representation of God is either accurate or slanderous, but never morally neutral. This being so, God can never be indifferent to wicked behavior. He is committed to clear his good name and avenge himself upon those who persist in misrepresenting him. If, you've been, if you have not been granted restoration in Christ, if you have not been granted restoration in Christ, plead with your Creator today while His face can still be sought. Do not think that He will abide your slanderous representation of Him forever. Even the good you do damns you. Even the good you do damns you because you do it for a reason other than the glory of God. You do it for something else, which makes that thing an idol. The good works you do damn you because they image God as an idolater. And so do you see then how foolish a dependence on your own good works to reconcile you to God is? Only the blood of Jesus, only depending on his righteousness and his complete work of imaging God and bearing the just penalty for your misrepresentation of him will save you in the fires of hell. Cry out to him. Call upon him. Call upon his name. He has never turned away a person who's called on his name to be saved. And he never will. Amen. In conclusion, please turn quickly to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 15, and follow along as I read. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, 
We know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not, you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius, and Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. King Jesus said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, the things that bear Caesar's image, in this case his money. The thing that is amazing is, what image did Caesar himself bear? What image does Caesar himself bear? God's. Caesar belongs to God. He owes all things to him because he bears the image of God. And you bear the same image. So I say to you, render unto God the things that are God's. Your whole life, everything about you, was intended to image the glorious one. You were made to manifest the glory of God's eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. Render therefore yourself unto God. Render yourself unto God. Let the whole world hear, elect and non-elect, render unto the God the things that are God's. You will not suffer his image to be perverted forever, but he is long-suffering and willing to restore. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Almighty God, it is necessary for us to apply the truths that we've explored this evening. It is necessary for us to understand you. So I pray for every soul here that, that each one would come to a greater understanding of who you are, of your nature and character, and through that knowledge that we might see who we are, how infinitely we fall short, how great our sin is, and how lovely Christ is, how amazing and wonderful his work is for us. And that in response to that, we will desire to image you as we were intended, as we were created, to glorify you, to image you in all that we do. I pray this will be a great encouragement to your, your sheep, your children here this evening, that you are interested in everything that they do, not just the visible things, not the things that we consider big, but the day in and day out things this week, of the laundry, the dishes, the homework, the, the, the going to work, provide for one's family. All of it matters because it's all an opportunity to image you, the one true and living God. May we be reminded of this, may we all be reminded of this, and may you continue to work in us to conform us to the one who imaged you perfectly, and who always does, because he is God. We love you, we praise you, we worship you in Jesus' name. Understand and blend with the glory of Patrick. Uh... -huh. 